<laughs> I love that video. There's just such great, just to see all the different aspects of what stick manufacturing is about. This is so great. Vader Live, we thank you all so much for joining us. I'm Dom Femularo, and I'm so honored to be a part of the Vader team. You know, we, uh, we have been brainstorming ideas for many, many years. I've known Alan for many, many years. Just the great team that they have. I'm so honored to be here. And by having the opportunity of this 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time Tuesday afternoon, a performance of hearing stepping into people's minds is so exciting. We do this every week, and we have next week, we've got Dennis Brennan. Dennis Brennan is the head of touring for Q Prime Management, an incredible person. He's worked with Metallica, Disturbed Journey. We'll talk about planning, designing, executing, and he's worked with Vader artists like Morgan Rose, Mike Wengren, and Dave DiCenzo. And Mike Wengren will be joining us at this point next week. So join us for Dennis and Mike and maybe even some more special guests. This is exciting to have him here. Today, it's it really is exciting for me because I get the chance to kind of step into the world of so many great artists. And this gentleman that we have today really is a really special player and person. Would you please welcome Mr. Zachary Alford. Zachary, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, Dom, it's my pleasure. <laughs> This is great to have this time together, Zach, to be able to, to step into your mind and step into your life. And I want to share information of what you have done, what you're doing, and let people really kind of get to know who you are in the course of the process. Now, you were born in New York, correct? That's right. So all your life you've been in, you've been in New York. You're born there. You're raised. You got involved with drumming at a young age. How did it all start? Um, well, yeah, I was, I was born in New York, Manhattan, and on the Upper West Side. Um, and at that time, there was, uh, you know, just like any time, I guess there's always music involved. And, and on the Upper West Side in particular, we had, uh, this is all before the internet, but we had our own little bubble of uh, really talented musicians. Uh, I don't know if you know, there's a couple of cool clubs that were right blocks from my house. One was called um, The Cellar. Yeah. And uh, another one was called Mikkel's. Yes, Mikkel's was huge. Yeah, so those, I could walk to those. They were like, you know, Mikkel's was on 97th Street. I lived on 92nd Street. So it was just like five blocks from my house. The Cellar was on 94th, and I lived on 92nd. So everything, you know. And uh, we had lots of great musicians in the area. As you know, the boys side, uh, Miles Davis lived up there. Yeah. Um, and there were lots of drummers. Um, Poojie Bell lived on 95th Street. Poojie is great, man. What a yeah. Great boy. yeah. Um, Dennis Davis lived on 101st Street. Nice. Uh, you know, and then there were other guys who maybe didn't go on to, uh, you know, world recognized fame, but they were great players and inspired me a lot. Well, that was a great area. And and I want people to know, like in clubs like McKell's, I mean, I used to go see Gad play with stuff at McKell's all the time. So there was so much great music at that time. So you were being influenced by living in the area, hearing all these great musicians. Were there any bands in particular that you were being attracted to at a young age? Um, not so much in, well, that kind of came a little later. I was mainly listening to records. And my record listening was very much dictated by my older siblings. I had a brother who was five years older than me and his sister was 10 years older than me. So I kind of just jumped on board with whatever they had. So they had the Rolling Stones, they had the Beatles, they had um, Pink Floyd, they had uh, you know all, all, the, all the popular bands at the time. What I didn't have was uh, exposure to jazz. Mm -hmm. So where I got that was from going and looking through the window at places like McHale's uh, and seeing seeing those artists that would pass through the area. So in, in all these, so the, the, these different players that are playing, you're hanging out with musicians, you're starting to meet up with people, or you, are you putting bands together and jamming and playing? How, how'd that all begin? Well, that started because um, in my building, uh, there was a drummer named Chandra Sharma, who was my older brother's best friend. And I would go to his house and look at the drum set. And, you know, I just kind of understood it. 
I just looked at it and, and I would watch him play and I'd be like, oh, that looks like so much fun. I really want to do that. And he would let me get up there. I was 10 years old and I'd mess around on his kit. And it was like, I was just hooked immediately. I just, I just felt like this is too much fun and <laughs> they're so beautiful. And I just love this making beat. You know, I didn't really know prior to that. I mean, I started out on piano. I had a couple of years of like classical piano training. I didn't get, you know, very good, but I got an understanding of uh, the linear layout of music. You know, it's it's really, that's what I love about piano. You can just see every note at once and you know what every note is by looking at it. Whereas like a guitar neck, when I look at that, it's like, I could be looking at Greek, you know, it's just <laughs> like, it, it just, it each string, everything gets shifted. And so you don't know what any note is, you know, whereas piano, it's like, that's a C, that's a C, that's a C, you know, that's an A, that's a C. So piano gave me a good uh, structure for thinking of chords, thinking of melodies, thinking of linear music um, and harmonic music. But the drums really just spoke to me. And so Pretty much the next year, my mom bought me a kit. We went down to 48th Street, yeah. Sam Ash, and she found this uh, secondhand Gretsch kit. And we bought it, and that was my Christmas present. And so from the age of 11 on, I just, I just kept playing and playing. And I didn't really take lessons. The only thing I knew were a few rudiments that Chandra had shown me, and that was it. You know, I had my double stroke, my paradiddle, single stroke, on a Gladstone pad. <laughs> and then when my drums arrived, I just jumped on them and, you know, played the full kit as best I could. And uh, immediately started to jam with friends. So it, I was right away into playing with people and um, trying to form a band. But this is just, you know, elementary school. This is not yeah. anything professional. So you, 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 you're playing the drums. You know, it's kind of interesting with with Ringo, Ringo talks about he didn't really practice with a practice pad and learn rudiments. His practice time was with bands playing music. Yeah. And that yeah. was what his practice time was. They practiced all day on the drum kit, working on tunes, working out parts and figuring things out. So it sounds like you had a, a real similar relationship like that. So when you yeah. got older, did you start to become more influenced in specific drummers? Yeah, because to, at this point, um, I was pretty much listening to just radio as well as our record collection. And so WABC at the time was just playing everything. I mean, the radio was, you'd hear a Hall and Oates, Queen, um, uh, uh, Elton John, um, yeah. you know, the Eagles, uh, Led Zeppelin, Beatles, everything. Um, but then, in sixth grade, I met a friend named Phoenix Rivera, who uh, was in my, he's also a drummer. Mm -hmm. And his father was Mario Rivera, the saxophone player. And he introduced me to jazz fusion. And so here I was uh, in sixth grade listening to suddenly Weather Report oh. and Ma Vishen Orchestra <laughs> and Stanley Clark School Days and Return Forever and Alda Miola, Elegant Gypsy. And, you know, it just blew my mind like, well, I didn't know you could even do this stuff on instruments. And so I immediately uh, got into a, a fusion phase. And, and WRVR was the station we listened to in those days, which was playing all the jazz stuff. Uh, you know, more, more not so much swing and bop, but like, yeah. you know, more the modern jazz. Contemporary jazz stuff. You know, it's just, yeah. And you mentioned these phrases. First of all, 48th Street in New York City was a street that had tons of music stores. You yeah, mentioned yeah. Sam Ash. Manny's was there. All of these yeah, stores yeah. are there. So when yeah. you walked down 48th Street in New York, it was literally like a kid in a candy store. Totally. Absolutely. Amazing, right? Amazing times to have that. It's no longer there the way it was. It has changed. No, no. In fact, I think it's like it's. they totally raised it now. They took yeah. down buildings. They changed the way it yeah. was. So it has it has evolved in the course of time. But at that time, it really was a magical time. And you, listen, you could have people walking in, you know, whether it was the early days of 
Hendrix walking into you know the store looking at guitar. I mean, it was just such an amazing time. Buddy, which would be walking in. It was you know there were so many people that I saw at that time. But then you mentioned WABC. WABC was a was was the radio station this is way before the internet we were still playing vinyl records at the time yeah yeah cousin brucey if you remember cousin brucey was the announcer and he was the guy that would interview all the bands when they came into town so you listen to cousin brucey on wabc it was the information center so when you mentioned these names of what it was you were really exposed to incredible music at an early time because of where you lived and what was available yeah and it's very diverse things weren't uh, as regimented as they are now. Um, Wolfman Jack was on, uh, <laughs> you know, and um, and so music was just uh, this wide open thing. You'd have Bohemian Rhapsody one second, and then you'd have, you know, Cap'n and Tennille, Love Will Keep Us Together the next second. Yeah. And it just all kind of melded together. Um, whereas at the same time, uh, I was listening to uh, a lot of, you know, Stevie Wonder and the Jackson 5 and, um, you know, all the Motown stuff. Not so much the older Motown stuff. I didn't get into that until later. My stepmom used to listen to them and I'd be like, what's this old stuff? You know, but um, but you had Marvin Gaye, uh, which incidentally is one of the first records I ever played with. Mm. In my bedroom, I had a phonograph and I had the album Let's Get It On. And I would just put that on and I learned every lick and would play along with that. You've got uh, Paul Humphrey. Yes. And uh, Ariel Jones playing drums on that. Yeah. And so I was copying that. And I was also copying Orleans, Still the One. Still the One. Uh. Yes. So, And that's Jerry Murata. Yes, that was Jerry Murata on drums. Interesting enough. And Paul Humphrey, who played a lot of those early recordings, eventually in his later years, played the Lawrence Welk show. Yes, yeah, I saw that on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable, like he amazing, went from yeah. that great music he was playing, going to Lawrence Welk, which of course was a great steady paying gig. Yeah, it's a gig. So just a, a great retirement gig for him. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great influence. So, so you listen to all these different bands, now you're getting older, when do you start playing with musicians and, and start to discover music? Well, that's a really, uh interesting kind of roundabout story. I actually was hanging out with a bunch of graffiti artists back in the late 70s <laughs> and early 80s. And they were older than me because um, I also, before I played drums, I was into graphic illustration and art and comics and stuff. And so I was uh, drawing and this guy who I was hanging with, who was older than, as I say, he was one of my brother's friends. My brother had gone off to the Marines and he left me in charge of Bill Rock, who was the president of the Rolling Thunder Writers a Club called RTW. Mm -hmm. And so every day I was just hanging out with him and we were listening to records and, and, you know, drawing and doing stuff. And he said, you know, I know this guy, his name is Shannon and he's looking for a drummer because you play drums, right? And I was like, yeah. I'm, you know, 13, 14. And so I go and I meet this guy named Shannon who plays saxophone and he starts a band called Johnson & Johnson, which is drums, saxophone, and guitar. And we played this sort of avant-garde downtown, like, I don't know, art dance music. <laughs> it was totally wacky, but I didn't care because it was the first time I'd ever gone to a club. <laughs> and, um, and you know, it was very, very avant-garde in the sense that these guys weren't, you know, accomplished musicians on their instruments. Mm -hmm. But the downtown scene at that time was just coming out of the punk era. And so you had what they called No Wave, which is also known as post-punk. And, um, you know, there are all kinds of artists on the scene there and clubs like the Peppermint Lounge, Jane Ceteria, uh, this club on St. Mark's that we were playing, which I think was called Studio 52 or something. Studio 354? No, it wasn't Studio 54. Was, was it it wasn't that, that place. This was like a tiny little dive. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's how I started, through this kind of graffiti connection. 
And here I was introduced to the downtown scene and we started gigging around and that just led to meeting more people and gigging and, uh, you know, a bass player named Hayward Earl Peel came to see us play. And he said, you guys need a bass player. <laughs> and so he said, I'm joining your band. And he joined our band. <laughs> and he later took me because he said, you know, you can kind of actually play a little, I think you're going to do more than just this. And so he introduced me to some other musicians uh, who were in a band called J. Walter Negro and the Loose Joints, which is oddly enough, another kind of graffiti connected band because the lead singer was, in, was a graffiti artist named Ali L. S.A. S.A. stands for the Soul Artists, which was a big Upper West Side club. Mm -hmm. And that band was becoming famous. John Hammond had just signed them uh, and they were going to Europe and Jay Walter was getting on, you know, magazine covers and stuff. They eventually kind of suffered the fate of lots of uh, bands who can't deal with success and they, they sort of disintegrated, self, self imploded. But through them, I met Tomas, the guitar player and Pablo Caligero, the saxophone player. And they introduced me to a bunch of musicians. And again, I'm just getting more and more infused into this New York music scene, which is largely underground, but it's very lively. Uh, Vernon Reed, uh, Kelvin Bell, um, you know, uh, bands like this, you know, Madonna's hanging around uh, before she's famous. It's just a really percolating scene of downtown activity where street culture and new wave culture uh, are clashing together and dance culture. So d dance, art, music, it's all kind of like, you know, congesting in this time, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so and... So at, at, at that point, you're meeting these people. I mean, th this this sounds like, listen, this is what we talk about social media and networking. This is networking at the grassroots level. Right. You're meeting these people. You're being inspired by their conversation. This must have been an incredibly exciting time. It was because I was also the baby. I was the, the youngest usually yeah. all the time, like by three, four, five years. And so um, Tomas was leaving the Loose Joints and he wanted to form his own band, uh, which Hayward, Peel, Tomas and I formed a band called, um, originally it was called Basic Black and later changed to IQ. And um, we started to play in a more dance oriented funk kind of vein. And, you know, we're playing alongside, as I say, uh, Vernon Reed had his, his uh, group. Actually, it wasn't his group. He played in a band called Defunct. And Defunct was another underground, downtown kind of funking institution, which was being very much uh, inspired by a new movement called the Harmelodic Movement, which was guys like James Blood Ulmer. And... Um, uh, Bird song and uh, you know Ronnie Drayton is in this group, but at the same time, I'm hanging out with my music and art friends and going to a little place you might remember called the Fifty Five Grand Bar. Sure, 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 sure. And it's also around this time that I was introduced to a drummer by Pablo Calajero, the the saxophone player. Uh, he introduced me to a drummer named Charlie Drayton, and uh, he took me to a place called. 7th Avenue South. I'm 15 now. And I'm going to see this guy play and it's just a total mind change. Yeah. You know, my, my mind was just altered from watching him play. And uh, then I would see him play again with guys like Hiram Bullock. There was this whole scene yeah. with, uh, you know, Kenwood Denard and uh, Jocko was there yeah. and you've got Russell Blake, Alex Blake, you've got Bernard right on keyboards you've got all these um jazz guys playing funk and it was just like that was kind of the real start of my education i think yeah. going to see hiram play um and charlie so about about what year is this because i remember going to seventh avenue south to hear gad play with the brecker brothers i mean it was just an, an incredible <laughs> club that any night you went there 
you were absolutely inspired by great musicians and great music. And you didn't even yeah. necessarily have to know everybody. You went in there and you were just guaranteed it was going to be great music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, 80, like 82, 82, 83, those two years. In the 80s in the New York scene, I mean, you had, there was glam rock, there was poppy type artists, there was, there were, you know, boy bands, there was so much good rap was going on, there was so much going on. I mean, it's at the cultural center of New York. How did you, you know, how did you take all this in? Well, you mentioned rap. Rap was just starting to, to appear. Yeah. And uh, so even even in New York, not everybody knew what it was yet. And yeah. uh, my neighborhood was one of the neighborhoods where people started uh, break dancing early. And so we were break dancing to um, these early rap records. Um, but even before, kind of before that, there was there were records like uh, there was one of our favorites was Jam on the Groove which was a Ralph McDonald song. And it had this drum break in the middle that was just irresistible for us. So, you know, we would, as kids, 12 year old kids, we'd be going to whatever, a block party or house party. And someone would put jam on the groove on. And then we would all look at each other and get up and start, you know, going to the middle dance floor. And um, the drum breaks not till the middle. So <laughs> at this point, this, the way you do it is like this. You basically all sort of, stand there and do your little step and we're waiting for the drum break and you know people are sort of dancing around looking what are these kids doing and then the drum break happens and one of us goes in the middle and starts to dance and then the crowd sort of makes a circle and watches these little kids and there's maybe uh four sets of eight and so four of us each get to do a little spinning on the floor kind of thing not head spinning that yeah. didn't exist yet <laughs> but you know we do something we call the helicopter and there were all kinds of other moves. And so hip hop was being born mm. and it was just in the air and it was in, it was, it was just happening around us. Uh, and at the same time you had Run DMC, well, a little bit later actually, but Run DMC was fusing rock music with rap. They were like the first guys to do that. Um, with another New York cat, um, Eddie Martinez playing all that fantastic guitar on those amazing run DMC records. And so I was getting influenced as much by drum machines as I was by drummers. Uh, and since we were playing dance music a lot of the time in these clubs, there was a real impetus uh, to play like a machine. Mm. And so I didn't, you know, and, and this is kind of to my detriment, I think. I didn't really uh, get exposed to what swing was until later. Mm. And so I played very straight, very straight eighth, which was great for rock, great for funk, uh, a certain kind of funk, right. great for dance. Um, but it didn't have any kind of old school quality to it. It was just the what was happening in the day. And um, and so that was kind of how it influenced me. You know, hip hop was happening. Like I say, we had the post punk stuff happening, we had the dance stuff happening, uh, and and the, the art street art scene. Everything was just a mix, especially in Manhattan. So this is good. So this is throughout the eighties now. So you get this is so great because in how you play, you've got so many different styles that are that you can pull from when you play that you can adapt. To whoever you're playing with, you've got an incredible resource that you can pull from that you can go wherever the heck they want you to go. Yeah. Uh, you know, I really believed in being a diverse player yeah, yeah. and I liked all kinds of music. And I and it was a little bit, you know, the scene was uh, a little bit of a kind of, you know, Wild West. It was like you wanted to outgun the next guy. And so. You worked on your chops. You you worked on your groove. You 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 tried to uh, to to be as well rounded as you could. So, what were you doing specifically for yourself in improving your craft? Were, were, were there? Were uh, you, not as much as I should have. <laughs> I was a terrible student. We all can say that for I'll sure. I'll tell you. Yeah, I went to um, around the summer of '78. I went to uh, Drummers Collective. 
and I started to take lessons there. But unfortunately, my lessons were cut short because I, my, my family decided to take a trip to California and visit my sister who'd moved away years ago already. And so I didn't get a lot done with my lessons. And even when I did, I could tell my teacher was not very happy with the amount of practice I put in. <laughs> and I can't blame him. But I remember one day at Drummers Collective, I peeked, I heard this drumming coming out of a room and I, I peeked in the door and there was this guy just playing the most phenomenal drums. His name was Kenwood Denard. <laughs> and later on, I looked him up years later and I did study with him. So I did some studying, but it was mostly like you said, I was just playing around. And before you know it, you're in four or five bands. You barely have time to do your schoolwork. You're just running around all over the place and you're playing all the time. So my real training was playing. Luckily, I could practice in my room and I would practice some records. Um, as I said, uh, I practiced to, you know, some Still the One, I practiced Marvin Gaye, but I also practiced to a lot of uh, Parliament Funkadelic. Mm. And one of my early heroes uh, was Jerome Braley. Wow. And I would just really study those records. And, you know, there's a whole universe to study there. It's not just the music. There's a whole, it's, you know, they're concept albums. Yeah, yeah. So I was into the whole universe that George Clinton had created. Uh, and, you know, I just became a total fan and had every Funkadelic record, every Parliament record, you know, Mutiny, the offshoots, Horny Horns, uh, you know, a sweat band. Um, Juno's records, Bernie Worrell's records. I was just immersed in that. Yeah. But at the same time, I was totally into Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and, of course, the Beatles, which is kind of where it all started for me. And so, really, my my huge influences at that time were probably John Bonham and Jerome Braley. Hmm. Well, this is kind of interesting, you know, as you went on and you started out, get, now you got all this influences, you're kind of getting your, you really kind of got a certain sound and a style going on. What was the first bigger break for you? Well, that came through um, being on the club scene and playing around enough that a bunch of people had seen me. And uh, one, of the, one of the groups that had seen me was a group called Defunct, mm -hmm. and I, who I mentioned before. They were, they were the more successful of the underground bands on the scene because they would go to Europe. Mm -hmm. They weren't just playing around in clubs. They were doing tours and jazz festivals and stuff. And a couple of guys from that band asked me to go to Europe with them. Uh, the first one being Melvin Gibbs, who was Defunct's bass player. And so he took me to Europe uh, with Vernon Reed, actually, the first time. Mm -hmm. And um, and we played in these these uh, these jazz festivals, you know, and you got a what they call the Eurail Pass. And so you would take the train systems all over Europe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there'd be a drum set there. I just brought my cymbals and my sticks. And um, we played all over Austria, Germany. We went to Copenhagen. Um, you know, it was it was great, and I did the same thing the next year with another defunct alumnus named Kelvin Bell, and he had a band called Kelvinator. Who the drummer for that band was this guy named Ronnie Barrage, who was phenomenal. Real, uh, he played like you know he could play like Elvin Jones, but he could also funk just like super nasty. And so I was trying to fill in for him and do these tours. And so here I was making money, uh, <laughs> traveling all over Europe in the 80s and just really still not necessarily saying this is going to be my career, but just going with the flow. You know, in those days, life just happened and you just did it. You know, it was like New York at that time wasn't the super expensive tourist trap that it is now. Yeah. You know, it, it was a, a place you could afford to live. You could afford to go out. You could afford to go to clubs. You could afford to eat. It, you, you didn't have to think so much about, oh, my God, you know, what's my future going to be? And I was having too much fun to think about that at all. Yep. And when I came back from that, um, I did my first uh, gig with an artist on a major label. His name was Grayson Hugh, and he was signed to RCA Records. And he was somewhere, I guess you could describe him as kind of like 
Dr. John, but with a voice a little bit like Sam Cooke. Uh, but it was blue-eyed soul, you know, to use a euphemism. Yeah. And um, and we had a two-month tour uh, backed by the record label. So we had a tour bus. You know, it was my first time on a tour bus. This is 1988. And uh, we opened for bands like um, Mick Ronson, Ian Hunter Band for one month, and then uh, Dickie Betts Band for another month. <laughs> and so that summer was my introduction to actual, like, uh, major label record touring, just the states. Well, it's kind of interesting when you think about, you know, you know, the, the fact of this. It was almost like this. It's kind of hard to explain sometimes. I mean, I'm 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 67, and I think back of those times. There was a freedom that you could not have to have the pressure of life. You right. Just went with you playing music, and you went from gig to gig and there was so much more opportunity of meeting musicians there were tons of clubs open there were tons of places that you can go and play and if you weren't playing you know after your gig there were some places that you can go to afterwards to hang out and hear other bands and sit in so there really was a this this uh subculture of life that allowed musicians to really exist you know we're, we're, unfortunately we just don't have that now have it have it today you know the way it is so it's really kind of an interesting time when you speak about this here so you're going on, you're doing this here. Now you're touring, you're experiencing Europe, you're experiencing what's touring, you know, in the bus, you're, you're getting all this experience. To a certain degree, you're hooked with this, right? Yeah, well, I'm just about to be, because what happened was, <laughs> uh, as you say, we're playing around in clubs, you're rubbing shoulders with, with, you know, all these other great, interesting people. And one of the people I reunited with uh, through my band Body Back, which was kind of like a rock, hard rock power trio I had. And that was the closest thing I felt to actually being my band. Um, now, what year was this? Because Body Bag was fantastic. What year was this? This was, again, well, it started in 84. We started playing around, you know, places like CBGB's and uh, the Pyramid Club and the China Club and Lismore Lounge around 85, 86. Um, and so in 80, by 88, um, Body Bag is now doing these workshop gigs along with another band called The Raging Hormones. Hmm. And we're doing it in a little space right by the Port Authority in Midtown across from the music building. So usually after rehearsing all day at the music building, you know, we'd stumble into this, what was actually a Chinese restaurant that turned into a club at night. Not the China Club, though. This is different. Right. And the other band there is the Raging Hormones, which is Steve Jordan, Charlie Drayton, Sarah Lee on bass, and whatever singer that they were trying to work into their band. Yes, yeah, they yeah, were I, still forming. Yeah. I, and I, so man, this was this was this these are exciting times. Yeah. So I'm watching Charlie play and and Steve play every night, and and they're watching us play, and you know we're hanging out. And uh, Sarah Lee, their bass player, walks up to me and says, you know, Charlie and I just finished recording an album with the B-52s. I'm like, B-52s? Oh, God, I love the B-52s. And they said, but Charlie's not going to do the tour. They want to audition drummers. I think you'd be great for it. And so I went down and auditioned for this great band that's right out of the whole no-wave downtown scene yeah. uh, with a cult following and it's just going to be nothing but fun right so this five-week tour turns into a 14-month world tour <laughs> as we're doing it so we start playing you know clubs and, and and small theaters and by the end of it we're playing giant theaters and arenas and you know i went everywhere with you know made videos you know suddenly it was like I guess this is my job now. Well, this is like the MTV time too. Don't forget, this is right. This is MTV, and you're hitting that big time. So, MTV B52s, which are huge, world tour. This is it. You've arrived. I was on TV, you know, multiple times a day on in, in three different videos, like for ten years. Yeah. It was just like okay, uh, and so exposure. Just you know, that's the best exposure you can get. So. Uh, from 
that really established me and made me think, okay, uh, I guess I'm a professional musician. <laughs> you know, we did skip over a little bit though, which was um, in 80, uh, 84, I started to go to college. I went to music, um, I went, sorry, I went to City College in New York. Okay. And I was trying to study for a computer science degree, you know, mostly to make my dad happy because he, he wanted me to have something to fall back on, right? <laughs> um, but I also took music theory classes. Um, the, mus the computer science thing didn't turn out so good. So I was flunking out, and after a year and a half, um, I said, I'm, I'm going to take a, a semester off. So I took a semester off, kept tooling around, and then a really good friend of mine, excuse me, said, you know what? Because he went to Berkeley College of Music. He's like, you should come to Berkeley. We don't have that many funk drummers like you. And uh, because even though I played all kinds of music, I I kind of felt like my, my first love really was funk. And so for 1986, I went to Berkeley College of Music. And that's when I studied with um, Tommy Campbell. What a great and that's play. when I kind of had a little more discipline. I yeah. could sit down and really work on stuff that I was being shown. And uh, you're also being exposed to all these other drummers. You're, you're, you're in your element. You're, you're, you're putting yourself up by all your peers. And this was my way to really see, okay, who am I? Where do I fit in? And uh, what is all this music stuff about? And so I'm learning, you know, chart reading. I'm learning more theory. Um, I'm, you know, learning a little bit of arranging. And there's also ensemble classes. So I was, I was getting a lot more musical training. But after uh, a year and a half, I, um, I went back to New York. I never got a degree or anything. But, you know, I definitely came away with something from there. So, uh, and, and part of that was really learning more about jazz and trying to play jazz and listening to Elvin, listening to Art Blakey, um, listen, you know, and seeing guys who were there, like Tony Williams came to town, so you go see Tony Williams play. Oh. So... So that that kind of figured into it. I just I just felt we kind of skipped over that. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's a, a great point. That's a great great part of of, of your history. Yeah. So, hmm. listen, you you got between David Bowie, between Bruce Springsteen, between Kelly Clarkson, Gwen Stefani. There's so many great artists that you have played with. So how did all that start to happen? Where all of a sudden your name got around, and and then even recording with Billy Joel. I want to talk about just all this here. Just really kind of opened up a whole nother place for you to go. Yeah. Well. I really have to say, um, working with the bees just kicked open the door because uh, I already had a lot of connections just from growing up in New York. You know, I knew Steve Jordan, I knew Charlie Drayton, um, I knew uh, Vernon Reed, I knew you know all these all these these people, and then lots of people I didn't know. I had the experience of touring with Grace and Hugh. I now had the experience of touring with the B Fifty Twos. I had the visibility. Suddenly, my name was a name in the hat. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was just it. I, I got a call one day from a woman named Debbie Gold, rest in peace. And she said, I've been charged with um, trying to round up musicians because Bruce just fired the E Street Band and he wants to put a new band together. And so that started the... Uh, the audition process for Bruce's new band. So he flew me out to LA and I played, uh, flew me back home. I don't hear anything. <laughs> Debbie Gold calls again. He says, um, Bruce wants you to come back. <laughs> flew me back out, play it again, this time with a different bass player, different guitar player. Flew me home again. This went on like four times. <laughs> and so this is over the course of, I don't know, two, three weeks, and I'm, I'm just wondering, what's going on, what's going on? Finally, he calls me back, and uh, at the end of this round of auditions, he's got me, he's got Shane Fontaine on guitar, Tommy Sins on bass. Roy Pitton was the piano player from the E Street Band who he kept, so he was the, the holdover. 
And he goes, yeah, I think this is going to be the band. <laughs> and so here I was, you know, suddenly uh, in yet another high echelon situation, you know, and that was really something because you really get to see how a guy who's been doing it a long time does it. You know, I mean, his security force is like the secret service. He's got guys who just every step he takes, you know, it's been checked out beforehand yeah. and, you know, just nothing is left to chance and everything's looked after. And because it's Bruce, uh, we were looked after and treated with total respect by the crew and everybody, you know, which when I think about it now, that's pretty phenomenal. Being yeah. some new guy stepping into something which was like a family, you know, you could easily be met with, uh, you know, kind of condescending stares, but everyone was as sweet as could be, as nice as could be. And that's really because of Bruce, you know, Bruce sets the tone. He set the tone, but like you said, you're talking about a real seasoned pro who has done it all, and it's all done so well. So you're now you're now at this level, and you're experiencing a whole other different scope of touring, yeah, and venues you're playing, yeah, yeah, and showmanship. I yeah. mean, to see what Bruce does live is phenomenal. It's it's. It's very unique, you know, and you totally get why he has the following he has when you see him. You don't necessarily get it from the records. I mean, obviously lots of people do, but not everybody. But anybody, if you see him live, you get it right away because he just has this this, this way of being so true on stage, so honest, so there for the, for the public. And, and he can draw you in too. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he can he can he can just uh, stomp around the stage like a like Godzilla, or he can just quiet it down to the most intimate little story about you know some guy having troubles in New Jersey, and it's like you just you just sucked in and you feel like he's reaching the last person in the farthest seat away, and and he just gives his all. I mean, he, he really he really gives blood and the shows the shows are long they're long shows yeah I mean, he's yeah doing, no guys, opening act yeah you guys are working we, we are the opening act yeah. and we're the closing act yeah i mean three hours easily is what what'll yeah. happen in, in yeah. those shows so so now you're really kind of working so so from bruce where'd you go from this point well um you know that that went on for a few years um and then, uh, as everyone knows, obviously, he put the E Street back, uh, E Street Band back together. And um, amazingly, that same year, I got a call from my friend Sterling Campbell, who is uh, a drummer I knew from junior high school. And he also had a, a really phenomenal career. Um, you know, he played with Cindy Lauper. Uh, so Duran Duran, and at this time, he had joined a band called Soul Asylum. But prior to that, he had worked with David Bowie. Hmm. And David Bowie had called him to do a tour, but he couldn't do it because he was in Soul Asylum. So Sterling, and David, David didn't want to audition a bunch of people. He wanted someone that uh, Sterling could, re could recommend so that he would not, he could just basically, you know, just, just get into rehearsal, rehearse, and then hit the road. Right. And so Sterling said, call Zach. And he did. So that was my in there. <laughs> and um, we rehearsed for for a week, just the band. So here it is, you know, Carlos Alomar is there. And, you know, I mean, Sterling and I used to sit there and listen to David Bowie records together. So here's Carlos Alomar in the room, you know, Reeves Cabrels. Gail Ann Dorsey, who I had heard her name, um, and we had actually met once before, but here's the first time we were actually playing together, and her first time with David as well, and Mike Garson on piano. Um, so we were rehearsing, and once we get enough of the material, you know, in some decent shape, 
uh, we move into SIR, into the big sound stage, because now we're going to have David come in. David comes in. And I swear it was the first time I just I just was like, I froze. I, I, I couldn't look at him because it was like, you know, his aura and his his persona was so mysterious at that time, you know, especially. He still was like an alien to people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then even though he'd have the mainstream fame of Let's Dance and Tonight, those videos were still so enigmatic and yeah. so like mysterious that you just didn't know what to do with yourself when he was standing in front of you, you know? So I, 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 I it took me a while to be able to just be normal with him, but, but he was so down to earth and so not the image you think he is. I mean, he really is, he becomes a character on stage and off stage, he's just, He's just David. But what an amazing you know, legend and iconic. And when you sense, I mean, you mentioned mysterious. I mean, he really branded himself in a way that was so unique that when 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 a show started with Bowie, it was it was full on excitement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he took you somewhere else in a whole other place. Yeah. Um, and he even said it himself. He says he said, "I'm not a rock star." You know what he was was some kind of. Sh you know, like shaman, <laughs> yeah. and uh, but but no, no more seriously. Like uh, he was into performance, and he played characters, and he was he was into theater, and he wanted to turn it into a theatrical thing. And he's he's largely responsible for the theatrical element that rock shows began to take on. Right, he really started that, and um, you know, he started he kind of defined glam rock, yeah, and uh, kind of defined art rock. To some, and he obviously was inspired by lots of things like, uh, uh, you know, craft work and can and uh, under velvet underground and all kinds of uh, diverse influences. But also, Philly soul was a huge influence for him. So, so working on his music was just a dream come true because I could play and draw from so many different styles, you know. And one of the styles I drew from very heavily was Dennis Davis's drumming style. Yeah. And he was definitely a big influence on me because uh, I had met him through Sterling Campbell when we were in junior high school because he lived in Sterling's building. So yeah. we actually, Sterling took me to his house one day. Sterling took lessons from him. And I remember, you know, walking into the, right, as soon as you get in the living room, there's a drum set there yeah. and um, a stereo. And a long cable, like a curly headphone <laughs> cable that went across the room to the drum set. And so Dennis says, sit on the kit and play. And you put the headphones on, you hear the record and you're playing. And, you know, at that time, I just wanted to show off so much. I just tried to play all the different licks I could. And afterwards, uh, the song was over. I took off the headphones and he goes, you know, you really need to play with the song. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> um, but anyway, you know, so so Dennis was was a big influence, and I got to here I am playing songs that he recorded. With, with you know, he's on so many David records. Yeah. Um, did, did he, he? He was on. He was with uh, Stevie Wonder for a while, right? Well, that's the thing. Here's a guy who not only played with the one of the biggest rock artists of all time, but he played with Stevie Wonder, one of the legends of R and B. Yeah. And he played with George Benson. Right. Because he's the drummer on, on Broadway, if I'm, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly right, yeah. He's yeah. one of the greatest jazz artists of the day. Yeah, yeah. And he takes a drum solo in it. <laughs> and it's an amazing drum solo because for its simplicity and its structure. Yeah. I don't know if you remember it, but it starts out. <laughs> and then he slowly builds it. Not into some huge, you know, uh, flurry of notes, but he, he builds it into, you know, more rhythmical elements and aspects. And it was just like, here's a guy who could play all these different genres uh, and still have, do it his way. He didn't sound like a studio player per se. He sounded like Dennis Davis. So here you are now. You, you, you're doing, listen, Bowie, you did, you did the... Um the outside tour, right? Then you did the outside summer festival tour. Yeah. And then Earthling. Yes. What was Earthling like? Uh, 
Well, that was fantastic because there's nothing like doing a record after you've been on the road with a band. So we felt uh, like we really knew each other. You know, we could we we didn't have to say stuff. We could just kind of communicate almost telepathically. Uh, but in typical David fashion, he threw a curveball mm. because he doesn't want you to be comfortable. He wants you to be out of your comfort zone. Because I think, you know, he he always says that's when you're going to do your most interesting stuff. So he had been experimenting with uh, with jungle music. But rather than hire jungle DJs to do his album, he wanted to get musicians, introduce them to jungle music, uh, which is DJ music, basically, and then see what comes out of that. And so he began the experimental process of trying to, you know, slow down the tape and record jungle rhythms and speed them up. And it was also the first record I had done that was very heavily reliant on uh, Pro Tools. Actually, I don't think it was Pro Tools, it was Logic, but um, it was still a new, very experimental way of recording and very futuristic. Yeah. And and it was great. It was a lot of fun, but also in David fashion, he likes to work quickly. So we didn't we didn't spend a lot of time on the songs. Everything was recorded very fast. So you just get like that first impression kind of thing and and then we jumped right back on the road after that. Hmm. Well, it's it's pretty amazing when you think about just how how the creative process happens. And how someone as brilliant as Bowie would just give you just enough information so you had to react instinctively. Yeah. yeah. That, that to me is the exciting part of, of where the creation comes from, where it's just in the moment, in that now. Yeah, yeah. There's some people who describe it as controlled chaos, like a lot of, you know, Bowieographers. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I say it's more like it's just honesty. He wants to get the, the truest thing, the first thing you say before you've had time to like let it ruminate and you know get influenced by the things, it's just your first expression. So it's like it's just pure and it's honest. Yeah, yeah. What's well, really powerful? We move along because now Danny Cooch, who I've had a chance, Kuchmar, who I had a chance to to interview him. Oh, Cooch. He introduces you to Billy Joel for the River of Dreams. Yeah. So now you know there's these connections that you've made are are guiding you along the way. They're leading you. It's like it's. <laughs> Synchronicity meets fate meets destiny. It's all kind of happening now. What was that like to work with Billy Joel in the studio? Oh, that was that was just a pleasure. He was such a such a cool, easygoing guy and funny. I mean, he was a guy who could inf who could imitate anybody. Like he would just break into like a Bruce imitation and sing just like Bruce, and you know, <laughs> playing it on the piano. And then he's doing Ray Charles, and then you know. He's doing Elton John, and it's like the guy can sound like anybody. Uh, so he's a super accomplished player, and writes brilliant songs. And um, here I am in the newly opened, um, uh, what you call it, the uh, Hit Factory, totally state of the art studio with you know there's like panels opening up on the ceiling and just like just so beautiful and big and vast it that was when i really felt like okay i've arrived because yeah. i mean i'd been to electric lady which is one of my favorite studios yeah uh, i've been to some other studios but this was like you know the mothership <laughs> just history. Like, deep history so, yeah and and um and that was a lot of fun just going in you had uh, nico bolus uh engineering danny cooch producing super sweet uh, and really trying to just get an organic, natural feel going. Um, Artie Smith was the drum tech and Artie would just bring just all of these beautiful drums to play on. Um, and it, it was really interesting to see the craft because it was totally different from recording Earthling. This was working from the ground up. It was, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't use a click. Uh, except on the title track. And we were just getting to vibe off each other in a really organic way. And um, uh, 
trying to get a very, very uh, organic, it's just the best word for it, organic sound to the record. Yeah. Boy, that's, that's so fantastic to see. You know, you joined the Vader team in 2005, 15 years ago, and you played the, the, the pro rock model, I believe so, right? Yeah. And, and what's amazing about it is that, you know, here you are playing consistently. You, you listen, Zach, you have a, you have a, a sound and a style that is just so, you know, exciting. You always play for the music and you've got these tools in your hand that's allowing you to kind of achieve this here, man. This is so exciting to hear these stories and go back you know, through the history. This is really pretty powerful. Yeah, uh, no, I've, I've had a fantastic uh, time playing Vader. They've they've really always been there to support me from day one that that we started our relationship. Uh, I love I love the pro rock model. It's it's a little bit longer than a uh, a five A. Um, uh, so so you get a little more reach, but also there's there's just a slightly different uh, momentum to the to the stick. And they're they're tough, great sound. The uh, it's it's not a round bead at the tip. It's a uh, oval. Um, they're they're durable. You know, I, I I've never been happier with a stick. Well, the, the Vader product, you know, all that they do, the Vader product is just so fantastic and so high quality and consistent and just it's so great when it's in your hand, it becomes a part of your hand. So that's a, a big yeah. part. Yeah. You know, the industry has changed and it has changed dramatically going back to those days when you're talking about the clubs. And where do you see the industry going now? That's a really good question. Uh, and I think anyone who thinks they know is probably kidding themselves because... <laughs> things change at you know a phenomenally fast rate now it's it's, uh, it's like exponential um but i do think live music will come back and that's one thing that's always remained consistent i mean drums drums have been around before anything yeah. before any other instrument we had drums before any business or businessman we had drums yeah. uh when the drum machine came along, everyone thought, oh, that's it, drummers are gone. No, drummers stayed. And as music's evolved, it seems like drums have actually played an even bigger role. I mean, so much music is reliant on just the beat now. Beats, beats, everyone's making beats. It's all about the beat. So I don't think drummers are gonna have too hard of a time. Uh, but the industry, well, you know, the internet, the internet really dealt the, uh, in the, the music business a, a low blow. Um, it remains to be seen what's going to happen now. I mean, I would love to think that uh, somehow artists are going to get a little bigger slice of the pie that they've been robbed of since uh, people stopped buying albums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that has to be worked out because people don't buy records anymore. So where's that money going to come from? And, and, and I mean, the money comes from advertising, it seems like, mm. and licensing. Yeah. But uh, it passes through a lot of hands before it gets to the, to the people who actually make the music. And that's the part that needs to be addressed, I think. Well, it's a great observation. Any chance of body band coming back? Uh... <laughs> oh, I would hope so. I would love that. that. Um, We've we all live in separate parts of the world now, but uh, God, that would be so great. And I don't don't think I don't dream about it. <laughs> you know, great great music. Well, you really have been a part, Zachary, of some incredible iconic tours and albums and what you're doing. You really have offered so much to the music industry, and still giving to this day. You're still actively involved in doing it and here we are we we, we continue on so you know it's it's a it's an incredible journey that uh, that you have blessed us with in your life and uh it thank really you. is fantastic thank you thank you dom coming from you i mean i said this to you before it's such an honor to to get a chance to speak with you uh and i'm saying it now for the record it's an <laughs> honor so thanks. that's so i want to ask you one one last question what would you what would you say to this next generation this next generation that uh 
may not have had the opportunities that you or even myself had growing up in those times. They're in different times. What would you say to them to kind of give them a bit of hope for their future? I would say, yeah, you know, you missed, you missed, you missed something, but they have opportunities that we never had. I mean, because of the internet, the actual uh, journey of learning to play music and, and uh, you know, hone your craft now, they've got so many tools at their fingertips now. And that's why kids are learning uh, almost at a phenomenal pace that, that, that it's mind boggling how, how much information is out there now for kids to access. You, you, can, you can just hear any musician you wanna hear now. You can, you can study them over and over again. Uh, so just, just find who you love, find what, what you feel most passionate about and, uh, and really explore it, really study it. Um, and just practice and don't give up because I mean, the one thing I'm realizing now is I'm practicing now in a way that I've never practiced before. I feel like I've got the discipline uh, to really sit down and say, no, I'm not happy with that yet. Let me work on it some more. Keep at it. You know, I never had anyone to really push me before. Uh, I just wanted to get out there and play, but the importance of uh, learning to, 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 have correct body posture is very important. Uh, learning to to develop your technique is very important. Um, so so really really just take the time. Don't be discouraged if it doesn't happen right away. The main thing is to just keep doing it, even if it's a little bit. Just keep doing it every day, and something will change. Something will happen, and just just enjoy the ride. Well, that's great, great, great advice. You know, that, that perseverance part is a really important part, which you are a great example of. And the fact that you have inspired us and continue to inspire us is really what we have so much to be thankful for. So, Zach, thank you so much. You have done fantastic. Thank you for having the time with you. Thank you to Vader to allowing us to have this opportunity. And uh, this will go on to Facebook and the YouTube channel. This will be around forever for people to watch. And uh, we've had people that have been involved here from Japan to all throughout Europe and Norway and through the U.S. So there have been tons of people that have joined us here to listen to every word that you've spoken. So thank you so much, Zach. You are the best. Thank you. Oh, so thank you, Dom. Thanks Peace. so much. Zachary Alford. Thank you so much, Zach. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Boy, how great to be able to have this kind of opportunity with, with Zach and hear his story and just the iconic players he's performed with and the records of what he's done and the grooves he's played to change the feel from what maybe what was brought into him, what he felt at that moment. This is These are real special artists and Zach for sure fits that bill really, really well. Next week, if you can join us again, next week we're going to have Dennis Brennan, as I had said, uh, Q Prime Management. He's the head of touring for them. He's worked with Metallica and Disturbed and Journey. And he, we're going to talk about the planning process, the designing process, you know, you know, be able to, to put this stuff into the journey of what it's like here and just executing it. Unbelievable. He's worked with Morgan Rose, Mike Wengren, Dave Desenzo, and Wengren from Disturbed is going to join us. So be here. 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, December 8th. We want to have everyone come back. Thank you all that have joined us from all around the world. It's a great, great message that uh, is being sent out. Thank you, Vader. And I'll see you guys all, God willing, we'll see you all next week. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.